Amen. Good morning, church. I think it's appropriate to ask the question after a song like that, what chains are God breaking in your life this morning? But you know, to answer a question like that, we first have to acknowledge that we each allow chains in our life. What chains are you unwilling to acknowledge this morning? What cages do you allow yourself to stay in? We're going to talk about that this morning, but I'm going to start off here in John chapter 6. You can turn there. We're going to be there uh, the majority of the time, but in John chapter 6, verse 60, it's a scripture that you probably all know and you've heard of before. It says, on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the father has enabled him. From this time on, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Do you want to leave too? Jesus asked the 12. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you so much for the time and opportunity that we get to come here and worship you this morning. I don't, I don't know if we think about it that often, God, but this is such a privilege. We can, in this place, come and freely worship you. We can open our Bibles. We can cry out to you in song and in prayer and in praise. And nothing will happen to us. There are many places on earth that are not that fortunate. So God, I pray that we take advantage of this. That we worship truly in spirit and in truth this morning. And that we don't let it be about this morning, God, but we let it be about every single day that comes. Move me aside and allow your word to make us into the people that you want us to be because you want us to be kingdom people, God. I believe that. And I pray that we can want that for ourselves as much as you want it for us. We love you so much. We thank you for this time. In your son Jesus' name, we pray all these things. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Um, Thank you guys for coming out this morning. Uh, I feel like this sanctuary is getting more full every week, and that is uh, extremely encouraging to me. Um, This morning, amen, we can clap for that. This morning, we're going to continue on in our Old God series. And let me just say real quick, I didn't mention this last week, but the campus ministry, for the most part, was gone all, uh, gone last Sunday. They had a uh, Southeast campus retreat, so most of them were up there. They had a fantastic time. Dom is going to come and give a report of that uh, when he preaches uh, in two weeks. But actually, a lot of the campus ministry is not here this morning either uh, because uh, they're doing something called Campus Swap. If you don't know what Campus Swap is, during our spring break, we go and help out another campus ministry somewhere in the South. So they went up to the Triangle Church in Raleigh, uh, and they are on campus this week with them, reaching out, studying the Bible, trying to make disciples. And then next week uh, on Triangle Spring Break, they're going to come here and do the same thing and help out our campus ministry, encourage one another, uh, do all that good stuff. So having said that, Kyle Saxon and his wife, Ali Saxon, will be here next week. And uh, Kyle, he, he led the campus, they led the campus ministry in Charleston for a long time. They now lead the campus ministry in the Triangle Church. Uh, but Kyle is actually going to be preaching the final sermon of the Old God series next week. Uh, that's the Old God's part four, name above every name. Uh, it's going to be a powerful sermon, so I do want to encourage everybody to come out uh, for that. It's going to be a great time. And then the week after that, actually, Dom is going to be preaching, um, and he's going to be starting a new sermon series. Uh, 
series, uh, kicking off a new sermon series called The Third Soil. Uh, so for the next two weeks, we'll have uh, Kyle Saxon preach and we'll have... Um, uh, Dom preached the week after that. And then again, uh, my father's going to mention this in the announcements, but on March 20th, that day that Dom preaches, it's our first light of the world. And I do want to encourage everybody to come out to that. That's going to be at 6 p.m. right here at the building. We're going to have the band. We're going to sing some songs, but we're going to spend a lot of dedicated time as a unified congregation praying to God and being the light of the world. Amen. Uh, so this old God series, right? Uh, the first sermon, uh, I talked about the first commandments, uh, how God told the Israelites not to have any other gods before him. And I talked about how before we were Christians, we all had gods that we worshiped, the gods that came before. But even as Christians, right, there are gods that are tempted, that we are tempted to put before Jesus, even though we have said that Jesus is Lord and uh, last week, you know, I, I dove a bit deeper into this idea of idolatry. We looked at the relational aspect of sin, right? It's not just about the gods that we bow down to that has such, I think, an archaic sound, right? The idea that we're bowing down to other gods. But it's, it's about where we are giving our hearts and the kind of love we'll receive because of that. God wants to give us Life that is truly life, but Satan, the thief, the old gods only want to steal, kill, and destroy. But if we keep those two things in mind, there's a big question that sits on my mind, a big question that sits on my heart as we further this conversation. If we know that God commands us not to bow down to other gods, and if we know the dangers in submitting to those other gods, then why in the world would we actually ever practice the sin of idolatry? Why would we choose something else other than God? And I do want to reiterate, right? Uh, this old God series is kind of the start of uh, the character, the, the second C in our mission statement. Communion, character, community. This is, this is us I'm trying to guide us as a church. How do, we, how do we become more like Jesus? And I really do think, like the reason why I think the Holy Spirit put it on my heart is because in America, we just have a whole bunch of other gods that we worship. And if we're gonna get to the place where we need to be, we need to make sure that when we say that Jesus is Lord, it's something that we actually mean. That when we say that Jesus is Lord, it's not a lie, right? It's not a, false, it's not a false thing that we're saying, that it's something that actually transforms our lives. But we cannot say Jesus is Lord if we have other lords that we're bowing down to. So why in the world would we choose other gods? I think to answer that, we can answer another question. Well, what really is idolatry? Right? What really is idolatry? And I'm going to give a very simple definition. If you're writing it down, if you're taking notes today, very simple. Idolatry is the act of replacing God. Idolatry is the act of replacing God. So the title of the lesson this morning, The Old Gods 3, Replacing God. Why would we do something like that? And if we can understand if we can understand that God should be the be all and end all, if we can get that here and here, why would we ignore that and place other gods on the throne? My first point this morning, life is hard, sin is easy. I'm gonna give three quick points. I always say quick. I'm realizing as, I, as we edit down my sermons that I'm, I'm like an hour preacher uh, I would apologize for that, but I think as Americans, for some reason, we have short attention spans. They preach for four or five hours in the Bible, so I'm not going to apologize. And uh, hopefully the Holy Spirit can uh, teach us all some patience and help us be excited about the word that's being preached. Amen. Um, but I really will try to go shorter. <laughs> uh, but, you know, uh, whatever I have in my plan, sometimes the Holy Spirit says, you know what, that's not what I decide to do this morning. So... Um, if I go long, just know that's the spirit uh, trying to get to you guys what he wants to get to you guys. Uh, I got three quick uh, points, uh, and these are reasons why we replace God, all right? So my first point is life is hard and sin is easy. John 6, 60, on hearing it, 
Many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Now, right before this, Jesus is preaching this sermon about how he is the bread of life. Right? He is the manna that came from heaven that, that we need to be with him. And, and he ends up saying in this sermon, look, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood if you want to get to the Father. And he's preaching this sermon. These people hear this. And at first, they kind of jive with him. They're like, okay, amen. Yeah, the bread of life. I mean, you know, we, we know the scriptures, the manna that came. God provided. So G God provides through Jesus. They're getting it. And then Jesus is like, yeah, you got to eat me. And they're like, they're like, wait, what? <laughs> Jesus is like, no, I'm dead serious. You got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they're looking around at each other like, hey, what is this man talking about? And what I love about the scripture is that it says on hearing it, many of his disciples. Let's, let's park right there. Raise your hand if you consider yourself a disciple today. Okay. Now imagine a church service where somebody got up and preached a sermon that was so intense that was so challenging that the majority of the people that just raised their hands decided right then and there, we're done with this thing and walked out. You know, I think when we read scriptures like this, we can oftentimes kind of interpret it in our minds that the, the people who walked away were the thousands that were just there to get their bellies filled. Were the people who saw the miracles and they saw the plethora of, the of food and they hadn't yet committed to Jesus, but they committed to getting their needs met. So, so they came and, and when, once they realized that Jesus was giving out more than just, you know, Texas Roadhouse rolls, right? Because that's the kind of bread that they gave out, right, in the Bible. We all know that with the honey butter uh, included. When they realized that it was more than that, they decided to walk away. It wasn't the crowds that walked away here. It was the disciples. These were people who had made a decision to follow Jesus in everything, who had made a decision to commit their lives to the lifestyle and the teaching of the Christ. That's who we're talking about in this scripture. We're not talking about the world here. We're talking about you. So when we, when we read a scripture like this and it says the disciples did something, we all have to sit there and think to ourselves, what would I do? Because I'm calling myself a disciple. I'm calling myself a follower of Jesus. If they walked away, what would I do? And why did they walk away? Well, it says right here why they decided to walk away. They told Jesus very bluntly, this is difficult what you are teaching is very hard for us to accept. What you are teaching is very hard for us to follow. Think about that. Have you ever had that feeling as a disciple? Man, it's just, it's tough to do the things of Jesus. But why? Why is doing the right thing such a difficult thing. You know, ever since the garden, living, right? The simple act of living has been an uphill battle. Satan has made everything rot. He's made it so that the things that bring death look better, taste better, and feel better than the things that bring life. Think about that. Like the, 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 the easiest thing I can think of that's an illustration of that is food. Everybody and their mom knows healthy food is nasty. <laughs> Everybody knows that. My mom was at my house the other day. Uh, I, had made some, uh, I had made some brownies. Now, you know, these were keto brownies, all right? I think they're delicious. Now, I'm going to talk about why I think they're delicious. But there's a thing of brownies right there. <laughs> My mom goes and cuts her a piece. She shouldn't be eating normal brownies anyway. Mom, where you at? <laughs> she, 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 she picked up a piece of this brownie. She took a bite. She said, mm-mm, mm-mm. 
she said, she said, she said, I wasn't in the brain space to eat a keto brownie right now. All right, you got to mentally prepare yourself to eat healthy food. Right now, we, 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 we laugh about that, but that's the easiest illustration when it comes to the way Satan works. That to be healthy in this world, it takes a lot more work than to be unhealthy. Like, look, ever since I got diabetes, our grocery bill has been through the roof. Because buying healthy food is just expensive. And I realize, look, a lot of people literally can't afford to be healthy. That's just the way it is. And trash food, it's cheap, and it tastes so good. <laughs> and we, we get addicted to it. You know, we be thinking about it, you know. And, and, and look, we don't even feel bad when we're eating it. Now, look, we feel bad later, right? Our stomach feel bad later, right? We ain't got no energy. We tired. I don't know if you guys realize, a lot of that comes from the diet, that's just a small picture into the way that Satan works. But it's, it's even more than that. Oh, oh, this is something I wanted to say. The whole idea of my mom saying she needed to be in the right brain space to eat that keto brownie. Here's the deal. My wife and I were talking about this, and it's like, doesn't it suck that, you know, unhealthy stuff uh, just tastes so much better. And she, she kind of brought up the idea. She was like, well, I don't know if it necessarily tastes better. I think we have conditioned ourselves to love the taste. That we, we, we have saturated ourselves so much with the trash that the trash is what our body craves. It's what our body is used to. It's what our taste buds are used to. So that when we eat the healthy stuff that, that's supposed to be good, it tastes weird, it tastes strange. And that's why I mentioned like, like for me, I'm, I've kind of gotten away from all the processed sugar and stuff like that. And don't, don't get me wrong. Look, if I eat even a little bite, like it's a, it's a battle for the next three weeks. The other day I, I had like a donut, right? And then the next three weeks, every time I was at Walmart, I would stand there in the donut section, just staring, wrestling with myself. Should I, or should I not buy this? I take one bite, man, I'm right back at it. But, but, but when, I'm, when I'm doing good and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm eating what I'm supposed to eat, like the stuff, not only does it not taste weird anymore, it starts to taste delicious. I start to crave it. And then, and then my body can, can, can actually get the nutrients that it needs. And it's, it's not this, you know, pulling my teeth to get healthy. It's actually an exciting thing. This is how spirituality works. We have saturated ourselves with the trash of the world. We have filled ourselves with the taste of sin and we like it. And the taste of God is not good. This is why you struggle in your quiet times. This is why you struggle to pray. Because I guarantee you, you put more trash in than you put God. You have not trained your heart. You have not trained your mind. You have not trained your spirit to love the taste of the spirit. And Satan's throwing out cheap food. He's saying, you're going to eat this, you're going to love it, and it's going to kill you. And we're going to celebrate while you go down. And we celebrate. But you know, it's more than that. I don't think life is as simple as just the fact that sin tastes good. Pain and misfortune are very real. Pain, misfortune, and tragedy are going to touch every single one of us, and there is absolutely nothing that we can do about it. And a lot of life, honestly, a lot of life is us trying to figure out how to navigate through the pain and the misfortune and the tragedy. A lot of life, I mean, there are atheists who literally believe that, that God didn't make us, that we made God in order to help us cope. A lot of life is just us trying to cope with the hurt. And you know what? When we're hurt, Satan provides the easy way out. One of the primary reasons we replace God is because keeping him as Lord doesn't alleviate us from our hurt and pain as fast as we would like it to. That's one of the primary reasons life is difficult 
and we feel like God just doesn't answer soon enough. More than that, we get a, we get a bone to pick with God, right? We, we begin to say unspiritual things, and, and I'm going to qualify that word unspiritual in the second point. But what, what, what we begin to do is we begin to say, uh, not, wow, you know, this misfortune has happened to me because I live on a sinful world full of sinful people, and misfortune happens to everybody. What we say is, God, how dare you put me through this? You know, we start to get weird in our theology. Well, God, if you're so good, if you're so good, how how come you let this happen to me? Listen, it happens to everybody. It's going to happen to you. And to sit around and wait, right? Or, Or in the good times to sit there and to think to yourself, like, yeah, like, God, I worship you. I praise you. You're awesome. Something bad happens. And then we turn on God. How ridiculous is that? How clearly does that show that we were not relying on God in the first place? How clearly does that show the old gods that we were still bowing down to? It was our comfort all along, not the God of heaven. And the moment that comfort is gone, the moment that satisfaction is gone, what do we do? We fight God. We blame God. We get angry. Or we just get sad. We get depressed, we get anxious. And Satan comes along and he says, you know, I can provide something for that. Your God, he's not answering. Your God put you through this in the first place. Isn't that, isn't that funny? Satan's sitting here in there tell, telling us that God put us through it. He knowing good and well, it's all his handiwork. He says, but I got some medicine for that. You know, if you, just, if you just think about it a lot, I'm sure you'll, you'll feel happier. If you just get yourself in a cycle of anxiety, you know, I'm sure that's gonna, it's gonna make you feel better in the end. This is what Satan tells us. And we believe him, you know? If you just, if you just go to that alcohol, right? Or if you just, you just go to that, that substance or, or, or you go to that impurity, these things are gonna make you feel better. Don't think about what's actually happening. Life is hard, isn't it? And Satan says, I have the medicine. One of the primary reasons we replace God, I'll say it again, is because keeping him as Lord, it doesn't give us what we want fast enough. It doesn't fix the hurt fast enough. In fact, God oftentimes is like, I'm not gonna fix the hurt. I'm the God of all comfort. You can be hurt and still feel joy. Paul said, I have learned the secret in being content in any and every situation. No matter what, this is, this is, listen, that is a wild mindset that we are not, oftentimes we are not prepared to have. You do not, we should not demand that God alleviate us from the hardship. God promises the hardship. God says, I will make you into people that weather the storm. I will make you into people that dwarf the hardship. I will give you a crown of glory that far outweighs your light and momentary troubles. Satan gives us fake food and he tricks us. Following Jesus requires patience. And if we don't have that patience, uh, we're gonna take Satan's way out. So just keep that in mind. That's the first quick point. I don't know if it was quick. Life is hard, sin is easy. My second point. Now listen, I'm just gonna tell you up front, I believe this is gonna be one of the most challenging sermons that I have ever preached. Um... So just prepare yourselves. Uh, Second point, spirit and life. Spirit and life. John 6, verse 61. Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? How often have have you read the Bible or you've heard a 
preacher say something or the spirit has brought something up in your mind and you feel offended by it. That's a powerful statement there. Jesus says, does this offend you? Are you angry with me? How many of us have been angry with Jesus because he's telling us to go a certain way? Because he's telling us to do a certain thing or to not do a certain thing. Does this offend you? What if you see the son of man ascend to where he was before? The spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. I would argue this is the point of this entire sermon he's preaching here, okay? And we're gonna, we're gonna get into it. The spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I've spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the father has enabled him. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Again, let's put ourselves in the shoes of these people. Why did they walk away? And would we? What's the difference between them and us? He says, the spirit gives life and the flesh counts for nothing. Remember, he's preaching this sermon about how, the, how he is the bread of life. He is the source of life that we need to partake in him. We need to be with him. He's preaching this sermon and, and these people are getting upset because they don't understand what he's saying. And he's trying to drill it into their minds. Listen, this isn't about the physical. It's about the spiritual. The flesh counts for nothing. The flesh will always lead to death. The flesh will die. The spirit brings life. He is exalting here in this scripture, the spiritual reality of things. But the spiritual reality of things is difficult to believe. And because it's difficult to believe, it's difficult to trust. The spiritual world, the Holy Spirit, he is difficult to believe in. And because we have a hard time believing, we have a hard time trusting. We replace God very simply because we are not spiritual. We replace God because we are not spiritual. Spiritual, we would prefer physical man-made idols rather than the unseen almighty God. We would prefer the things that we can see rather than the things that we cannot see. And, and we live in such a, a, a religious climate, right? Especially here in the South, right? Church on every corner. We have the language of spirituality, we have the language and the rhetoric of the spirit, but do we have the lifestyle of the spirit? Do we have a true dependence on the spirit? Or are we actually transformed by the spirit? Or do we just use the words to make ourselves feel better? We fail to understand that the physical things might make us feel good. And they might make us feel good quickly. But God makes life authentic. And he makes it last. He makes it full. And you have to ask yourselves, what do you want? A life that, that you, you have your needs met quickly and it, and it feels good. Or a life where you have to endure but that is truly life. One of the big things that I, uh, I'm afraid of is being a Christian in America. We're gonna talk a lot about this next year. Um, Secret Church is actually coming up um, 
I haven't been announcing that, but it is something that I want us to do as a church. But what Secret Church is, is uh, basically it's a secret underground time of the word and prayer for Christians who live in countries where they're not allowed to openly worship Jesus. Christians who live in countries where they will be killed if they worship Jesus. And we in America get to partake in this thing, right? Uh, with complete freedom, we can, we can uh, come to our church buildings and turn on the TV and, and read scriptures and pray for a few hours where there are, there are Christians in the world that that's like some of the only time that they can be with other believers and really dive into the word for fear and, and honest truth of, of being murdered. And my fear is that it is very difficult to actually be a Christian in America. I'm going to get more into this. But for as long as I preach, and as long as God gives me the opportunity to serve you all in this way, I am going to hone in on authenticity. Like, we have to be disciples, like real Christians. And if, if we're not, none of this makes any sense. Like, what are we doing? Why are we here? It, it's, it's a farce. We're all clowns. We're clowns. If we, if we come here and, 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 and scream and cry and worship and sing, and, and, and we're not actually living like Jesus. So this is, I'm, I am, I'm going to be very dedicated to this idea of being genuine. And, and, it, and this is not to be mean and it's not to judge you and it's not to make you feel bad, but Jesus is worth it. He's worth being real, right? He's worth being genuine. And it's, it's just, it's something that it's hard to do in America, okay? And I'm gonna get to it. But spirituality is hard. Relying on something you can't see is hard. It's hard to be spiritual because it's hard to believe and trust. And this is why God gives us the spiritual disciplines. You know, uh, you've probably heard the story about uh, m my wife and I and how um, I ended up, uh, how we ended up together. So we had kind of an, on, it was, I won't say an on and off thing. There was a time throughout college I liked her, she liked me, blah, blah, blah. Um, when I came back from Barbados after my junior year, I at some point had come to the conclusion. I, mean, I was talking to Cody one night. I, I didn't know if I really liked her or not. And he was like, Perry, what are you, you know, what are you terrible at? I was like, you know, being empathetic and graceful. And he was like, and what's Nikki's strongest, you know, spiritual gift? I'm like, empathy and grace. He was like, exactly. And in that moment, like she was my wife. Like there was, there was, there was zero doubt in my mind. I was like, oh, okay, I need to marry her. Um, like that, that's the only decision that exists in my world, you know, moving forward. This is that, that she's my wife. Um, so then I'm like, all right, you know, let me go, you know, and win her heart. But she, you know, she was into this other guy and I got super insecure. So there was a period of like a few weeks where I tried to work really hard to like win this competition. Okay. And I took her on this date and it was awesome. And, and we were like, you know, we were, I remember we were ice skating. I can't even ice skate, but that night I was, I was, I was, I was good, man. I was gliding and, and it was, you know, we were like laughing and it was great. And I remember the next morning I was standing back and the other brother, I remember she was standing up. She, I was in the back of the auditorium. And like I, I talked about back then, I already had the, the, the super sense of knowing where she was at all times. And so I was standing back there and I, you know, I kind of like glanced to see where she was at. And she was with the other brother. He was making some joke. And she was like, <laughs> and I realized like it didn't matter how hard I worked. She was just into this other guy, right? I don't know if it was the jorts I was wearing or the capris I was wearing, <laughs> the strange hats I was wearing. I don't know what it was. She was just into this other guy. And there was a time, there was a moment that happened where I, I literally gave up. I was like, all right, I, I'm not going to fight for this thing. And so I prayed, I was two prayers I would pray in every day. I'd say, God, either change my heart so I don't like her because I think it's unfair that you've given me these feelings and she doesn't like me. So fix that because I'm cool with not getting there, but you got to go ahead and fix my feelings 
or wake her up, you know. And again, I've told this story. A few months go by, her discipler comes to me and she's like, Perry, I don't know what happened, but her feelings have awoken for you. She said those words and I got chills. I was like, oh my gosh, that's the literal answer to my prayer. Um, and you know, a month later we were dating, a year later we were married. Um, now we got like 10 kids and you know, we're having a good time. Um, <laughs> But why do I share that story? Well, because on a very small scale, there was a moment of, do I work toward the physical or do I trust God? And literally the answer was to just stop, right? To trust in what I couldn't see, to not trust in my own strength and my own power, and this is what God talks to Israel about a lot in the Old Testament. Uh, and I've, I've, I've shared some about it before, but, but even this idea like, hey, don't go to Egypt. Don't rely on this king or that king, that army or this army. I am your God. I'm going to get this done. You need to trust in me. Even though you can't see me, you need to trust in what you can't see. You need to trust in the spiritual. And it's, it's just hard to do that, isn't it, church? Let's not sit here and be like, well, you know, you know maybe for you it's hard, Perry. Like, no, it's, it's difficult. So I'm gonna give a few practicals real quick on how we can believe and how we can trust, okay? Faith is belief plus trust and commitment. So when we talk about believing and we talk about trust, that together, we're talking about being faithful, Okay? Faith is belief plus trust and commitment. The answer to being spiritual, to being reliant on the Holy Spirit, that's what I mean when I say spiritual. The answer to being spiritual is being faithful. So how do we grow in our faith? First, read the word. Romans 10, 17, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Faith comes from hearing the word, okay? If you are not consistently in your Bible, you are not faithful. You can't be, right? That's like saying if you don't drink water, you can't be hydrated, right? And I'm not saying that uh, because you read your Bible, you are faithful. You can very easily read your Bible and still not have faith. But I'm saying you cannot be faithful and not read your Bible, You cannot be full of faith and not hear the word of God, not be ingesting the word of God. Faith comes from hearing the word. Second practical here, prayer. Mark 9, 23, right? The demon-possessed boy, the disciples were trying to heal him, they couldn't. The boy's father says, uh, you know, if you can heal him, Jesus says, if I can, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And we can think to ourselves, well, Perry, this isn't a scripture about praying. He's talking to Jesus. He's asking Jesus, help me overcome my unbelief. This is a prayer right here. We need to be praying the same prayer every single day because We got a lot of unbelief. We need to be praying the same prayer every single day. God, help me overcome my unbelief. Increase my faith. Matthew 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you for everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds and to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Ask God for more faith. Be deep in prayer. Listen, again, prayer doesn't make you spiritual. It's not like, hey, I prayed so I'm spiritual today. But you cannot be full of faith if you are not praying. You cannot be full of faith if you are not praying. Luke 18, right? Parable of the persistent widow. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but it starts off, Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray. When do you pray? Always. I was on a workshop the other day all about the Holy Spirit. We're gonna get a lot into that next year. But the guy, he was explaining to us how he had been asking God for years for the gift of unceasing prayer. I'm like, what is that? 
It's like, it's a gift where your mind is always engaged with God in prayer, no matter what. I was like, I need that. I want to get there. You should always pray and not stop praying. And then fasting, right? The same demon possessed guy, right? Mark 9, 29, the whole story ends. He says, this type only comes out by prayer and fasting. The spirit of unbelief is an evil spirit that needs to be purged just like the evil spirit in the scripture. Fasting is one of the only ways to practice a real trust in the unseen, non-physical things. It's how we hear the voice of God and teach our physical bodies to rely on the spirit. At the end of the day, we replace God because we lack faith. So let's put in the work church to be genuine in our faithfulness. Let's actually be spiritual. And I cannot stress this enough. We cannot accomplish the work of God. I can, I can stand up here all day long and preach messages and, and give you a vision and a mission and tell, we can talk about which way we want to go and the things we want to do. We cannot do these things if we are not spiritual. So you work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Don't look at your small groups as, as little hospitals to make sure you're reading your Bible. Come to your small group already reading your Bible. Don't make your small group leaders treat you like baby Christians when you've been around for 20 years. Be reliable. Be spiritually reliable. Because we have to lean on each other. We can't have... 20% of the people doing 80% of the work because they're the only ones who are willing to be spiritual. And it's not difficult. Open your Bible. Fall in love with the word of God. Recognize the privilege that you have. Guys, let's, let's, let's take it up a notch. The flesh counts for nothing. And we do a lot of stuff that, gratify, that gratifies the flesh. We don't do enough that empowers the spirit. We gotta change our lives around. We gotta turn things upside down because through us, if we do that, God will turn the world upside down. There's power in the name in the blood, in the spirit. My third point, somewhere else to go. Somewhere else to go. John 6, 67. The disciples leave, a lot of them, most of them. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? He's like, what you talking about? You have the words of eternal life. We believe. Starts there. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus replied, have I not chosen you? I love that. I love it because Peter hyped Jesus up. Jesus like, that's what I'm talking about. Because I read the scripture and we all do. And you know, we look at Jesus like he's some kind of robot, like it didn't hurt that his friends were walking away. Right? It's something that we all have felt over the last two years. How many friends have we seen walk away? Not only over the last two years, over the last 10 years. You've been here for a long time. You've seen people walk away. Here's the deal. It always hurts. It always does. Jesus was no different. I feel like he asked this question with tears in his eyes. I feel like he asked this question really fearing that they were going to say, yeah, you know, this is too hard too. 
But Peter's like, nah, I don't know what their problem is. We ain't got nowhere else to go. But that's the problem. This is why it's hard to be a Christian in America. Because we got other places to go, don't we? The context of this scripture is really eye-opening for me. Jesus, he's preaching a sermon emphasizing the spirit. A lot of people think that those who left had issues with the concept of, of eating his flesh and drinking his blood, and they did, but it's because they were thinking in a purely physical sense. They were not spiritually minded. More than that, they were not willing to be spiritually minded. So they left, thinking that there were other physical and worldly avenues that they could choose to meet their needs. Jesus' preaching sounded good as long as it met their needs. But the moment it challenged them, the moment it required them to move out of their comfort zone, they saw his teachings as optional. Oh, this is great. Oh, yeah, do this. Love your neighbor. Oh, yeah, do this. Wait, deny myself? Wait, take up my cross daily? Be willing to die? Eat your flesh and drink your blood? Think spiritually? Rely more on the spirit than on the flesh? Oh, no, sorry. There's other things I can be doing other than that. Oh, no, sorry. There's some other God I can worship that's not going to make me do those things. There's some other places I can go. Each of us have to ask ourselves the question, do we see Jesus' teaching as optional because it's too hard? Think about it. Do we see Jesus' lordship as optional because there are other lords that boast a life that is just as good as the promises of Jesus. And we all feel that tension, right? We see people walk away. We see people leave Jesus and they're getting everything they want. They got more money now. They got a girl now or a guy now. They're a lot more happy. They're having fun now. And we think to ourselves, wait, wait. They have everything and we have nothing. We still over here struggling, denying ourselves. Like that's a fun thing to do. And, 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 and Satan starts to tempt us to think, yeah, do you really have to stay here? Do you really need to do this thing? I mean, think about it, church. How much would your life really change if you never came back to this place? The scariest thing about that is that some of our lives wouldn't change at all. And that says something about what you're doing now. You think about it. If we are not thinking spiritually, then Satan can always, always provide for us a physical life that feels good and makes us think we don't actually need God. In the end, we replace God because we feel like we don't need him. We replace him because we think he's replaceable. We replace him because we have other places to go. We start to we start to build these little vacation homes, right? You know, I'll, I'll go live in the house of Jesus sometimes when it's convenient. But when I don't want to, I got that home to go to. I got that home to go to. I got that home to go to. Sunday morning, I'm going to be in the house of God. Other days of the week, it just depends on what's going on. Right? Depends on how somebody treats me. Right? Depends on if somebody hurts my feelings or not. Depends on if somebody offends me or not. We treat Jesus' lordship, again, like it's optional, like it's, a, like it's a switch. We flip on and off. We have the privilege of doing that in America.
Peter's response is telling. First thing he says, right? He says, well, it's not the first thing he says, but he says, he says you have the words of eternal life. Jesus, or Peter's response highlights that the goal of what you want is important. What Peter wanted was the life that Jesus provided. Peter wanted eternal life, life to the full, life that is truly life. That's what Peter wanted. And he didn't want any other kind of life. So the goal matters. You have to ask yourself, what do you really want? Because oftentimes a lot of what we want, we can get out there. Or at least a lot of what we think we want. You want comfort? You can find it out there. You want satisfaction? To an extent, you can find it out there. Short term, at least. You want money? You can find it out there. You ain't gonna find it in here. I ain't found it in here yet. (laughs) There's a whole bunch of stuff you can find out there. Peter says, I ain't got nowhere else to go because you have what I want. What do you actually want? Do you want this life that Jesus is saying he's gonna give to you? What's your goal? Number two, Jesus says, or Peter says, where else would I go? He saw Christ as irreplaceable. He saw Christ and this lifestyle of Christ as something to which nothing compared. Is this how we see our relationship with God? Or are there things in your life that actually compare to the life that Jesus is trying to give Is this how we see our relationship with God? And then thirdly, Peter and the others, they had literally given up everything because they wanted to make sure that there was no other place they could go. And this is the part where it's going to get scary. It got scary for me. It's still scary for me. They didn't have the temptation of somewhere else to go. They didn't have a backup plan for life. They didn't have something to fall back on. They practiced their faith completely, relying solely on the God of heaven. Are you, are we willing to get rid of the things that we're falling back on? Are we willing to give up everything for the sake of following Jesus? I'm going to pause here for a second and talk a little bit about this concept of giving up everything, right? Because we love to point out the rich young ruler or even the disciples. And we love to say things like, well, Jesus didn't really mean that we have to give up everything and sell everything. But we say this so that we can justify being Christians and not actually doing it. We spiritualize our way out of literal scriptures. (laughs) For one, I do think that when Jesus spoke to the rich young ruler, I think he meant it. He told him, you lack one thing. What did he lack? The scripture doesn't outright say it, right? Because he he, he told Jesus, look, I I done did everything. I'm legit. I'm a Christian, right? I guess they weren't Christians yet. He's like, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a genuine Jew in whom there is nothing false. Jesus says, yeah, you lack one thing, sell everything. And then come follow me. What did he lack? He lacked faith. He lacked a willingness to actually depend on Jesus. It's easy to be pious when we have everything else. I think he meant it. And I also think that the disciples actually did the same thing that he told the rich young ruler to do, right? They they gave up everything. They followed Jesus. They lived a minimalistic lifestyle, like quite literally. They had the clothes on their back and just had to depend on the kingdom of God and whatever that was and amorphous sense to, to take care of them. And it took care of them. And that lifestyle completely opposes the American dream. We tried to do that right now. People would look at us like crazy homeless bums. 
But, what, but why do I say that? Why am I saying this? Well, well, two things. Jesus calls each of us to the same kind of radical lifestyle. And it's a lifestyle that I'm not sure we're actually able to even comprehend as Americans. Like it is so anti the American dream, so anti the idea of, of, of being in this country and, 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 and taking care of yourself and, and having this much amount of, amount of money in your bank account and having this kind of house and this kind of car and taking care of your family in this way. All Jesus don't talk about none of that. He said, sell everything and follow me. Listen to this. Our riches, and and I'm gonna talk about why Jesus tells us to do this, okay? There's a very practical reason why he tells us to sell everything. Because our riches give us a thousand other options other than Jesus. A thousand other options other than Jesus. That's what our riches do. So what's my conclusion, right? As I prayed through this, I studied out this concept to me, I found something that it's, it's just, it's so intense that I felt like I, I didn't even want to preach it. I, I don't want to say this because I have to hold myself to the same standard. But this is where I've landed. This is, this is what I would like, okay? I would like for the scriptures that say give up everything, I'd like those to be less, less physical and more spiritual. And, and, and what I mean by that is, like, I'd like for us to be able to read those scriptures and see those lifestyles and come to the conclusion that we don't actually have to give up our physical stuff. We just need to make sure that we give up everything to God, right? Like, we don't have to sell our homes. We just use our homes for God's kingdom. Or we don't sell our clothes. We just, you know, we use them for God's kingdom. We don't quit our jobs. We just, we, we work for them as if we're working for the kingdom of God, right? Et cetera, right? And, and we've heard that sermon before. That's the easy sermon, okay? And I I do think that Jesus calls us to that kind of radical transformation of everything that we own, but there's a difference in temptation. Listen to this. There's a difference in temptation when we look at it from that point of view. It is harder to keep our riches and be faithful than it is to give them up and to have no choice but to be faithful. Let me say that again to make sure we all understand this. It is harder to keep our riches and genuinely be faithful than it is to actually give up everything and have no choice but to be faithful. This is what Peter meant when he says, we have nowhere else to go. It was literal. Like we literally have no choice but to rely on you, Jesus. We have zero choice. If it ain't you, it's nothing. But we have so many choices. And I think we're all in that former category. We have kept our riches. And we are fighting every day to make the right choice either to rely on God and not idolize our riches or to replace God with our riches. That's the choice that we have. If you want to keep your riches, which obviously we all have, if, you want to keep your, if we want to keep our riches, then we have a choice. And living in the land of choice is a lot more difficult than living in the land of no choice. Because we can just choose not to follow Jesus. And because we are afraid of the radical lifestyle that Jesus calls us to, we're afraid of what he tells the rich young ruler, because I think a lot of us would walk away sad as well, and that lifestyle doesn't fit in America. We cling desperately to the lifestyle of choice rather than the lifestyle of surrender. We each have to realize that's where we live. In the, we live in a lifestyle of choice, not a lifestyle of surrender. And that to me is scary. If we are spiritual, then we can always choose correctly. Okay? Now hear me out. I'm not saying that it's sinful to be in a lifestyle of choice. I'm just saying it's a lot more difficult to actually be a genuine disciple. 
the only way you're going to choose correctly consistently is if you are spiritual. If we fail to be spiritual, then each of us will live our lives playing a never ending game of worshiping both Jesus and the idols that we refuse to get rid of. That's what our lives become, a back and forth. Because we, we, we refuse to let it all go. And again, I'm not there. I'm not about to go sell my house tomorrow. I'm in the same boat as everybody else. I mean, I got three kids. <laughs> I am not spiritual enough or faithful enough right now to do what Jesus calls us to literally do. So I have to live in the land of choice. If I'm going to live in the land of choice, that means that I have to make the decision every single day of my life to literally make sure that all that I do is being surrendered to Jesus. I believe that this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? The disciples accepted it. And listen to this. They accepted it even before Jesus had gone to the cross. The disciples had less examples of Jesus's power and yet more faith than us. Why is that? Well, it's because they were actually with him. And if the cross is not enough for you, the fact that Jesus loved you so much that he broke death, that he was willing to take all of our sin, take our place, if he was willing to die for us so that we could be made new, if that's not enough for you, which it should be, and we have to work every single day, church, to make sure that we walk with Jesus just like the disciples did. That's what it means to be a disciple. That's what it means to be a Christian, to walk with Jesus every day, to choose Jesus every day. And it takes a lot of faith to hold on to our riches and still glorify him with them. And I believe we can all do that, church. And I believe there's 200 people in here who have been doing that for the last 30, 40 years. And I am very grateful to your example. But I'm preaching a lot of this to this younger generation. You know, you're, you're 45 and below. The old pros and young professionals, the people who should be on the front lines right now, It's our time. We have the example, not only of the saints and the faith uh, of the Christians right in this room, the faithful right in this room, but we have the word of God and we have the cross. We have Jesus's death breaking example. We have every reason to choose faith. We have every reason to choose God. We have every reason to rely on Jesus and to see all of our riches as a means of glorifying him. So this morning, church, let us choose correctly. This morning, let's keep Jesus' love and his sacrifice at the forefront of our minds every day so that everything in our lives can be given to Christ and we can be radical despite our riches. Church, what Jesus did was a radical thing. And we are called to live radically. Let's pray. Father God, you are so good. And I thank you for this, uh, for your example, for your love. I thank you for being worthy of being relied on. Um, it was difficult for me to discover this sermon. Difficult for me to write it. Difficult for me to preach it. And it's going to be difficult for me to live it out. And I know it will be for all of us, God. But this is why you went to the cross. This is why you died. This is why you gave yourself up for us so that we could be transformed, so that we could be spiritually minded, so that our sins could be washed away and that we could live with your Holy Spirit within us. 
We can have the same intimacy with you that the disciples did. Therefore, we can have the same conviction that the disciples did. We can live radically just as the disciples did, God. And I pray that we can keep that in our hearts and in our minds as we leave here today. Let us truly exalt you in all that we do. Your son, Jesus' name I pray, amen.